Hello everyone, welcome to Shred's Takes, and I'm here again with my college basketball slash NBA basketball co-host, Riker Vance. Riker, thanks for coming back on to the show. Man. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, what a what a final four we have, Shred. I'm, I'm excited to talk about it. Man. Yeah, so for those uh, who are new to the show, uh, make sure you subscribe and uh, like this video for, for you can get notifications for latest videos. But Riker and I are going to talk about our thoughts about the Final Four uh, this weekend. FAU, we, we've got UConn, we've got San Diego State, and we've got Miami. All oh, the Final Four, first time ever a top three seed has never been in the Final Four, which is nuts to think about. So let's start with how they got here, right? So FAU beat Kansas State to get here, San Diego State beat Creighton, UConn destroyed Gonzaga, and then Miami came from behind to beat Texas. So from those matchups, let's start with Miami versus Texas and talk about what is it, what does Miami bring to the fold, in your opinion, that's going to make them dangerous against a team, team like UConn? I mean, I think their guard play is excellent. That's where I'm looking at. But what are, where are you looking at with Miami? Yeah, I think Miami just shows, you know, they're just a gritty team, man. I mean, to be able to be down double digits second half of an Elite Eight game and be able to overcome a team like Texas, I think just shows that, you know, they're they're a very well-coached team. You know, to keep that positive energy, be able to keep playing hard and being able to execute on offense, mostly because of the guard play, like you mentioned, um, it just shows that they can really beat anyone. And they can beat anyone in the country. I think UConn's going to be a big test. We'll get into that a little later. But I, sh I think it showed showed a lot out of the Miami program because that's a big time game against a big time team in Texas who's been on a roll. Um, but you know to be able to with withhold the storm and come back and come out on top, um, advance to the final four. I think it, I think it's big time. How much do you think with Miami is the fact that Larry Nega has allowed them to kind of play free basketball as opposed to system based basketball? I mean, for those who don't understand what I mean by that, it's the idea of. You know, system-based basketball, you watch like a team like Gonzaga, right? A team that runs their sets, tries to get, or Purdue, Purdue's a perfect example of a system team, getting into their sets, trying to get stuff off of their movements, off of ball screens and that stuff. Well, I, I say freedom of, freedom of play is being able to just kind of get the ball and make reads and kind of understand what you're doing as a defense, right? So do you think that like that freedom that Larry has allowed his team to play with is gonna is the reason why they're so dangerous? Do you think that it, helps prepare them for the games they played against other teams? Yeah, no, I think I think that's a very big part of it because Miami, you know, they don't always get the top recruits. They're not a blue blood like they do Kentucky, Kansas, you know, they, they get a lot of transfers, a lot of guys, two, three year guys. And I think um I think just letting those guys they're all college basketball players. They're all elite athletes. They're all very, very good at what they do. And I think their coach has been able to realize that and put them in positions in which they're going to succeed. And I think it comes comes to flourish in, in Miami's transition offense. And when a team like a Texas or a team like Houston, Houston especially, you know, Miami's up five, six, with about four minutes left. Houston's trying to put on the pressure, trying to put on a full court press, which Houston, one of the best defensive teams in the country, that's a very difficult press to break. And Miami just, instead of just, you know, taking the pressure, and just trying to take care of the basketball, get into a set, get into a play, wasting 10, 15 seconds of the shot clock, they're on the move. They're pushing the ball down. They're, they're trying to get two-on-one opportunities, and I think they're a very deadly team when it comes to that, and I think that's just credit to their coach. And I think their coach puts a lot of trust in Wong, Isaiah Wong. I think he's their best player. He's their most consistent player on a night-to-night -night basis. And just from a guard perspective, the ability to control the game, both from scoring and facilitating the way Wong does, I think it allows their coach to kind of just, all right, my guy's got this. I'm going to tell, tell them the spots that I think they'll be good in, but at the end of the day, it's just five players hooping. And I think that's why my name is so versatile. Yeah, I mean, I think also the, the, the player I think that should be mentioned. I mean, obviously, you think about Jordan Miller's game against Texas, where he was 7 for 7 for the floor. Perfect. Perfect. Incredible, right? <laughs> but I, I look at Norchet Omir as the, as the glue for that team, primarily because at 6'7", 245 pounds, that's big. Uh, that's a big boy. <laughs> um, but he, what he does so well is the fact that he allows that offense to be able to play from the perimeter. And also, he's such an offensive rebounder. You know, he's averaging 15 rebounds a game, and that's incredible. A guy, 
I mean, look, we're both six seven, you know, and, and that, that's not easy to, you know, especially against those like Division One big guys who are six eleven, seven feet tall. You know, it's not easy to do that. So yeah, I get Miami credit from that standpoint. I want to shift over to F- FAU for a second here. Um, I, like most people, did not even I didn't even have it being Memphis, you know, and. I'm going to give credit to Dusty May right now. He has done some of the best coaching job um, I've ever seen, at least in the last 10 years, being able to get that team to, A, out-rebound all their opponents by a significant margin for not being the biggest team, and, two, to be, like, so a cohesive unit. You know, what are, what are your thoughts taking away from FAU against Kansas State? You know, that was a an incredible game, obviously, from a lot of standpoint, right? Marquise Noel has a lot to be proud of from that season. But talk a little bit about what you saw from FAU that had allowed them to have the Cinderella run that a lot of people I wouldn't think would expect from a team that was a nine seed. No, I mean, you said it best. I mean, FAU is only an hour from me, man. So I feel I feel bad for not having more faith in them. But I had, I had a, a good Memphis team beating them in the first round. And then I would have had, I believe it would have been Purdue I mean, we had Purdue winning. I don't know if anyone had Fairleigh Dickinson beating Purdue first round. But, you know, we would have had Purdue beating them in the second round. But I think it just goes to show, man, there's talent on all levels of college basketball. High major, mid major. Doesn't matter where it is, man. These these kids can hoop. And when you have a group of guys that, like, with with a head coach that can – lead them pointing all in the right direction everyone on the same page every every brother loves each other type of thing man it could be it could be special and we're witnessing one of those special runs right now which is and i mean you can look at it from all four perspectives all these teams man like they're like you said none of them top three seeds and you know they're all kind of slept on whether it's injuries or just not being able to figure it out. FAU is kind of the one standout because they've had just an incredible, you know, they have one of the best records in college basketball. But, you know, I think I get, you just got to give credit to FAU, the coaching staff, the players for believing in themselves. And, you know, when, when they win their conference tournament, they, they look at Memphis and they're like, no, we can beat Memphis. And then they, they go like that game by game to a Kansas State team that, you know, has a Keontae Johnson, has a Marcus Noel. It's a big time right. game in Madison Square Garden. And they're, they go out there and perform. And, you know, you just got to love to see it. So, um, yeah, I'm curious to see. I know there's – I know my favorite player on FAU is Bolden, the big man. I think he just does the perfect job at just – being around the basket, getting boards, offensive, defensive, and you know, just making a simple play of dunking the basketball. Um, and I think, but I think the guard play is what really makes this team dangerous. The big shots that they're able to hit. But I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, I think those are all excellent points, mm-hmm. and I and I think that mm-hmm. you know, cohesion at this time of the year is is the important part for being successful, right? And it's not just about running your system; it's about how that how the players fit and how the players work together and i agree with you i think what really hurt kansas state last game is they didn't really have an answer for golden at all and you know he had 14 points and 13 rebounds but they had 44 rebounds compared to kansas state's 22. think about how many extra and and especially they turned the ball over 22 times and still won because of those extra possessions because yes you're saying well you're giving kansas state extra possessions Right, but then if you're allowing a team to get 22 extra uh, you know, opportunities to run their fast break offense or get an offensive rebound where you get a bucket, mm-hmm. that's the one thing that I, I've been impressed with with FAU is the idea of resilience, right? It's something that we talk about in sports all the time. I'm just impressed by it. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll give the statistics right now. They have like three guys in double figures that are averaging. Giles Davis, Elijah Martin, and uh, Golden are the only three guys who have – Double figure scoring numbers this season, and the, and the lead rebounder only is is Golden with six point six. So it's not like they have a guy averaging you know twenty five and whatever. It, it, it just it shows you how exactly. And you know they they go against against a team in San Diego State, who I love to hear what your thoughts about that because I mean we just watched I think one of the ugliest <laughs> Elite Eight games, and that's not a disrespect to San Diego State. That's just the way they play basketball. They play through their defense, and I thought. You know, obviously it was a controversial call probably at the end of the game. I don't think it should have been called, but I, you know, regardless of that, you know, again, San Diego State definitely deserved to win that game because of just their cohesion. But, you know, like FAU, I, I like, you know, segue into their opponent, which is San Diego State. 
and kind of what do we see from San Diego State as a team that, like, why are they in the Final Four? Why are they able to beat a team like Alabama, who is the overall number one seed? How are they able to beat a team like Creighton, who had all these offensive weapons? You know, what were your thoughts about kind of the, what you observed from San Diego State? And why do you think, you know, from a defensive standpoint, they are so difficult to score against? Why do you think that is? Yeah, I think San Diego State is like the perfect example, and I'm sure you're going to know exactly what type of team I'm talking about. But imagine it's an AAU tournament. You play two, you play one game on Friday, three games on Saturday. You got an 8 a.m. Sunday, right? And it's this team that's just all up in your face, traps, presses, absolute pressure, and just makes every step that you take on the court just the the worst experience possible. That's what San Diego State is to me. And they just have bodies, and they got absolute dogs on that team. They got plenty of them. They're a deep team, too. They don't mind something. And, man, they just go after it. They just go after it. The offensive end can be a little ugly at times. Um, but at the end of the day, man, a W is a W. And they, I mean, being able as a team to identify what you want your identity to be as a team, which is just, in this case, just an absolute defensive nightmare, for the other team, like especially for a high-powered offense like Creighton, they just hone in on their identity and they accept it and they embrace it. And I think that's what's gotten them to the Final Four. I think it's possible to win a championship with that type of team, even when the offensive, you know, flow isn't always flowing. Um, but I, you know, I think we'll get into it. But I think elite shot making can overcome elite defense in basketball. Good offense beats good defense because at the end of the day, if you if you put that ball in the basket, that you know there's not much the defender can do. I'm I mean, you know I'm curious to to hear your take on the game, but you know I'm curious to I'm curious to hear if you think San Diego State can kind of overcome their offensive struggles in the team against FAU, which isn't exactly known for their defense, but throughout the past couple games. They've been the top, you know, they've been the top defense. They wouldn't be here if they, if they weren't. So I'm curious to hear uh, what, what your take on that would be. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I also have the stats pulled up. Um, so feel free to take a look also. But I was I was interested, obviously, in looking at the stats because I wanted to see kind of how the, the scoring splits for San Diego State go. And I didn't realize it was this distorted. I knew that Matt Bradley was the dumb fair scorer. But, I mean, they literally, the next league scorer is at 9.9, .9, I think that is, from Trebell. I mean, that's that's nuts. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, and the fact is, they're a team that, you know, you, we talk about can they, you know, can FAU overcome San Diego State? Well, again, you can't doubt a Cinderella team, right? That's, I think, the first point. You can't doubt a Cinderella team. The, the, the thing about San Diego State, the reason why they've been so effective is Brian Dutcher, the head coach of San Diego State, has them believing that they can win every single game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that sounds so cliche. Everyone, everyone should believe in themselves. Everyone should, you know, want to believe that they are the supreme team out there. But there's a difference between talking about it and doing it. And I think from they know what they are. They know they're not the most offensively gifted team out there. But the one thing they can hang their hat on is defense and rebounding. You know, obviously Nathan Mensa, their big guy, is an elite level shot blocker. You know, A Rob off the bench. He's a, he's like that big that like, that big that him and him and Ladie. Yeah. So you know, they were they, they, they were guys who also provide a lot of resistance defensively. And Ladie, Ladie can score a little bit better. Like he can kind of put the ball on the ground and kind of get into like those little like eight to ten foot jumpers and drive to the rim. And you know, I think look, they made they made things difficult for Ryan Kalkbrenner in the second half. I mean, he he couldn't get a post move off. I think that's primarily because Kalkbrenner is not in a, like that's not really what he's known for. He's known for more rolling to the rim, and I just don't think his footwork's that great. Um, but to be fair, I think that you have to credit San Diego State on that lens. To answer your question about what FAU can, what I see in that that kind of matchup from an offense standpoint, the thing about FAU is they love getting in transition, and the way that San Diego State can combat that. It's San Diego State does not really let you get in transition because they, they they take so much time off the clock offensively, and then they get into like a ball screen and they they get guys back and they, they match up and they, and they 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 beat you up physically. I mean I mean they, they are one of the more physical defensive teams I've seen out there, and they've always been this way. Even when Steve Fisher was the head coach, they've always lived through their defense. It's so ugly to watch, but again, it's effective. I mean you know you gotta give Coach Dutcher a lot of credit. He knows what to, what it, what it takes for his personnel to win, and you hear in his press conferences, you know, and it's tough because you don't. I mean, for my thing with FAU is, you know, FAU lives to their guards, 
and they have a good big who I think is better in the post than Cockburn. He's not a better player than Cockburn, but he's a better post player than Cockburn. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's going to be an advantage. Just like how do they take advantage, I think, of that matchup? Like, is Golden's a guy who can really take advantage of that matchup against Menzer, who's an incredible defender? But I'm saying that's where they have to make advantage of the matchup. Their guards are not going to be able to get by those guards. And those guards are too defensively. Golden's going to have to be really effective down on the post and on the glass. And, you know, it's, it's going to come down to two things, which I want to hear what your takes are, because we'll, I guess we'll segue into UConn in a second after this. But I think the two things for them to beat FAU, as I got a few to beat FAU State, is you've got to control the pace of the game. You know, you got to make it a little quicker. And you've got to control the glass. You do those two things, you got a chance to win. I think that Alabama didn't do that, and I don't think Creighton did that. And so, if you do, and it's hard, right, against those ten defensive teams. But I'm curious what you think that, how do you think FAU can beat San Diego State? And how do you think San Diego State can beat, San Diego State, excuse me, can beat FAU? Yeah, no, I think those are two very key points to this game. And I think FAU does a phenomenal job, like you said, of pushing it in transition. And I think they have to just really harp on that. Every single possession, whether it's a make or a miss, we know that San Diego State is going to take their time. They're going to use 20, 25 seconds of the shot clock. They're going to have guys back. But that doesn't mean you still can't push the ball. Maybe it's not a transition layup uncontested, but you get transition, you get guys swinging people moving it you know it doesn't allow the defense to just set up so you're going against a set five san diego state defense i think that's one of the hardest defenses in the country to score against i think they've proven it this tournament um and i think fau does a relatively good job at that i think um for, as for the second point um talking about wait san diego state trying to beat fau no, no, you made a second point about. <laughs> oh, um, get, getting the ball into, uh, oh, yeah, you control the glass. Control the glass. Controlling the glass, I think, is going to be a little bit more difficult just because of FAU's size. I think the athleticism on San Diego State with guys like Mensa in a rope, um, as well as others, I think it's just they're a very good rebounding team, and they do so because that just because of how good they are defensively, a good defensive team is most likely a good rebounding team just because they're able to stay in front of their guys and as soon as that shot goes up, they're all five boxing out. Um, so I think that's really, really going to be the key to the game for FAU. If they're able to use Bolden, get second chance opportunities, off probably tough contested shots from the San Diego State's defense, I think that's going to be the key to the game for FAU, more so the transition, because I think you can kind of, you can push the pace at least one-sided constantly, but rebounding is rebounding, man. It's just getting that ball. Um, but I think what I, you know, with Matt Bradley, I look at Matt Bradley, and in that Creighton game, he did not have, he didn't have his best game. And, uh, you know, it's, that, sometimes that's how it goes. But San Diego State still found a way to win. And I think that's a big testament to not only their coaching, but just the other four guys out there. But the reason I have FAU winning, man, is because I'm, I'm a fan of the Cinderella story. I'm a fan of the Cinderella story. And, I'm, you know, as a Florida guy, I would love to see a Florida national championship. I don't know if we're going to get it. But from this side of the bracket, I do believe we're going to get it. I feel like this is just, you know, a group of guys that just are, you know, all clicking at the right time, and I think they're going to be able they're going to be able to upset a, a San Diego State team ranked five. Um, but I'm curious to hear curious to hear your opinion on this. I'll let you go first before we get into UConn uh, versus Miami. Yeah, um, ironically, I, I think I'll I'll wait to give my pick later. Oh, no. um, more more that I want to I want to talk about. I'm interested in the UConn Miami matchup first, and then we can obviously get, like I'll I'll go through my picks in a second, but. Yes. Um, now, look, obviously with UConn, they have been by far the most dominant team in the tournament. And I, I don't think it's even a close competition. Uh, the closest game has been 15 points against St. Mary's. So put that in context. They play against Arkansas, it's a really good team. They put against Gonzaga, who's obviously a very good team with an All-American big guy in Drew Timmy. Julian Stroud is really good. And they beat them by 30. I mean, it wasn't even close. In the first half, it was close, and then basically they just kind of took over. Mm -hmm. And when I look at UConn, I think of two things. I think of a really strong starting five with Adama Sonogo and Jordan Hawkins. But I look at their bench. You can bring in Diamond Klingon. You can bring in Joey Calcaterra, the great shooter. They are just so deep. They don't have a weakness, I think, in their team. And I think for, you know, I'll actually go into, I guess, who I think can win this game. And then I'll 
take a talk about the San Diego State FAU game later. I think that UConn has the edge in this one primarily because I think Miami is a very good, very good offensive team. I think they're, they're disruptive defensively for sure. I think the problem with UConn and their experiences compared to Texas is UConn has a very deep team and a very good offensive team that can just turn it on at a given moment. And I think that's something that no team has really shown me that they've been able to do against Miami. Mm -hmm. Texas, not really. I mean, without Dylan Dessou, they didn't really have that ability. You think about Houston, Houston's starting five is really the glue of that team. They don't have a deep bench. And Indiana's kind of that same problem. Indiana's a good starting five, not a good bench. So when you go through all of that, Miami's a really good team. It's going to be a close game because Miami's offense is going to keep them in it. I just think that UConn has the ability to shut them down, potentially. But even if they don't, they have the offense that's just too much of a firepower. That's where I kind of go when I look at that matchup. I'm curious to hear what you think, though, because, again, it's it's, it's kind of for Florida. Man. You guys got two teams in the uh, Final Four. Yeah. But I think that from that standpoint, I look at UConn as the winner. Again, to put it in context, my picks have been terrible. <laughs> but, you know, I think that's uh, that's where I go with, with that pick. I'm curious to hear your thoughts, though. Yeah, well, I'll preface what I'm about to say with um, our picks and my picks as well have been terrible too. Uh, <laughs> I think that's you know that's kind of the feeling most college basketball fans have, man. That's why this March Madness has been amazing to be the weirdest one in history. The weirdest one in history, and that's cool. It's cool. It's it's awesome to see all these guys be able to win on the biggest stage. But um, going back to the UConn Miami game, yeah, man. As a Florida as a Florida kid, a Miami FAU national championship would be insane however i don't think it's going to happen just because and i you know i don't even have a solid one two three reasons i just think uconn is the best team left in the in the tournament yeah. i think because it's been such a weird tournament we have all these teams who have great backstories they've been on great runs uconn is uconn is uconn and i you know i was late to the party i thought arkansas you know a younger but you know, very talented team was, would be able to kind of knock them off earlier on, and I couldn't have been more wrong. And they've been absolutely dominating ever since. And I think it's just, you know, it's a ship I've got to jump on. I mean, you look at a guy like Sonogo. I don't know if there's a person, a, a human being left in the tournament that can kind of stop him. He's just on a certain run, and just the way he's able to find his spots in the offense, the particular moments in time to demand the ball in the post, and just absolute takeover. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at a guy like Jordan Hawkins who can turn it on at any moment. Caravan, uh, a mass guy, uh, um, but he can, he, he's a lights out shooter. He could kind of, he's a good uh, system player, kind of finding, you know, he, you know, he can pump fake and drive to the rim. He could facilitate a little bit here and there. I just, like you said, their guys one through about eight or nine can all come in, all produce. Um, and, you know, their coach, their coach has had a, cuff, a tough, cuff, a tough, ish career I'd say you know he hasn't really been able to take that big leap but now that he's here I think he's gonna go all the way I got you commenting it um I don't know if we're gonna circle back now to San Diego State versus uh FAU yeah. I'm curious to hear I'm curious to hear your take on this this is, a, this is gonna be a very interesting game it could go one of two ways it could be an FAU show or it could be kind of an ugly San Diego State show so I'm, I'm curious I'm curious yeah, so, I mean, I the issue with both these teams, I doubt both, and look where we are now. Um, so, yeah, it's a tough, this one was, it was a tougher one for me to pick because both teams are good enough where they can get to the national championship at this point in time. Yep. Now, I'm going to say I'm picking FAU in this one, and... You know, I, I probably will learn to eat my words when I'm discussing this Monday Monday afternoon, uh, but uh, or at least it's Tuesday afternoon after the national championship. But it, it, it just goes back to the fact of I think they can score easier, um, and I do think that they have the ability to switch, which I think can help them combat a little bit of what San Diego State's going to do offensively. But I think that the difference is is that Golden can actually score in the post. Coffner really can't. And I know people are saying, well, Coffner shoots 77 percent. All his shots are roll to the rim, layups, and dunks. Mm -hmm. Right? And you saw when he got the ball in the post, he wasn't that effective. He tried to turn over short, and you, either it was a travel, he lost his balance, 
he got a shot blocked, something bad. Right, and, and the thing is, you know, people are saying throw the ball down to him in there, but it wasn't working. And, you know, I think, at least with Golden, he, 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 I'm not saying he's, he's not better than Culver. That's not what I'm saying. But I, but I think that in terms of being able to get a buck in the post, he showed against Kansas State, and he can clearly do that. And, you know, I know Kansas State's a smaller team, but, he, you know, he was able to do that effectively. I mean, he dominated that game. So I, I like FAU. I, I think it's going to come down to the last minute of the game, last, last moment. Yeah. I think both games, frankly, I think the, the UConn game I don't think will be as close as the San Diego State and FAU. But I'm with you. I think UConn is going to win the whole thing. And I think it comes down to two things for me is the, set, the idea of depth, like I said before, with UConn. And I think that they're just not a weakness, right? Their problem has always been consistency. Playing to the level of competition, they can, they're, they're, they're taking the opponent seriously. And I think putting all the pieces together. They, Coach Hurley has been able to do that right now. Mm -hmm. And they're playing the best basketball, and they looked at the team that was so down at the beginning of the year, where everyone was saying, this team's easily going to win a national championship, right? So I think that'd go there. Yeah. But I think the, the, the big question I want to ask, too, is what, as basketball fans, what can we take away from this March Madness tournament so far? I mean, obviously, I know what we, this is probably a question probably to save after the national championship. But I was thinking about that as we were talking about it now, because Obviously, you look at the fact that this has been an unprecedented March Madness tournament because of the teams that are in the Final Four. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear what you, based on that, what can we take away so far from the March Madness tournament that fans should appreciate about this year's tournament? I mean, I think I think we've touched on it before. Um, I think it's just, it's an any given Sunday, any given Saturday, any given Monday type of tournament, man. And I mean, look, we both have.